applications for 3D agglomeration. The talk will be given by Jerry J. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm the joint work with John Bogovic and Gary Wang at Genelia Farm. Uh, and I'm actually going to be talking about uh, two different papers that are at ICLR, ICLR this year. Um, deep and wide multiscale CRISP networks, uh, and then um, learn versus hands-on features uh, for 3D elaboration. And uh, the model defined in the first paper, which I'll talk about, is actually the one we use uh, in the latter paper. Uh, and also, I'm just going to you know, just take one minute to talk about the application that we're studying here. Um, so this is a brain on a dish. Uh, and the application which we're going to be applying the experiments to are data coming from this field of connectomics, which is basically trying to measure neural network structure in natural brains. Uh, and the approach is to take you know, actual brains and then slice them up, uh, image them, uh, and then get a very large picture of the brain, basically. Uh, and uh, OK, this isn't really how it's done. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, machines and diamond knives and ion beams and stuff like that. Um, but you get the idea, right? Um, but actually, the real bottleneck is not the image acquisition process. It's in the image uh, reconstruction phase. So we get these very large three-dimensional 8-bit uh, intensity data sets, and we want to basically trace the wires um, in, in that data. And it turns out uh, <clears throat> this is a reasonably hard problem, uh, and it's also the entire bottleneck uh, in this process of actually acquiring neural connectivity information. Uh, and here's a post of what that data looks like in a little bit more detail. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Synapses and uh, so the first one I talk about is a new model for doing boundary prediction in this context, um, deep and wide multi-scale person networks. Uh, so the problem we're trying to solve is taking this type of data I just presented, uh, finding the boundaries in the images, and if you can do that accurately, that will obviously help you a lot with segmentation. Um, for a number of years, we've been using uh, deep networks of various kinds. You know, going back to 2007, in fact, um, and you know these have been very successful. In fact. Uh, we've used uh, such networks to reconstruct uh, about a thousand cells in the retina, uh, which was published recently. Uh, but you know, a, a theme which has obviously been discussed quite intensely uh, at this conference and other places is that it takes a long time to learn the networks that do this. So um, for us, uh, we use 3D filters um, everywhere in our, our network. So in fact, it can take months to train uh, the best networks, and it keeps getting worse because we want more power in our models. Uh, so because of that, um, you know, we'd we like to somehow have models that are more tractable. Uh, you know, we'd like to put more uh, model complexity into them. We'd like to explore larger parameter space and cost functions. Uh, and we'd like to quickly retrain based on a new label data. Uh, so we'd like to define a, a new type of model which um, is somehow much quicker to train, uh, but also has several architectural features. So we're going to define three things which I'll talk about in turn. Uh, the first is a wide feature representation. Uh, the second is a large field of view. Uh, and the third uh, is uh, the ability to model statistical structure uh, in the able space. Uh, and I'll explain what, what I mean by these things. Um, so the first is pretty straightforward, uh, now versus wide feature representation. So in the convolutional networks I've been using in this context, uh, you know, each layer uh, was pretty narrow. So maybe on the order of 20 to 30 feature maps uh, per layer, um, with all the connectivity between layers. Uh, and again, because of the 3D filters, this was still quite uh, uh, computationally costly to train. Um, but that seems sort of you know, very narrow considering you know, the complexity of the data and so forth. So we'd like, we'd like to at least be able to test uh, approaches that have many, many more features and potentially thousands. Um, and of course, that's going to come at some sort of cost. Um, and so uh, we're going to make the decision, uh, instead of using supervised learning to learn all of our features, we're going to learn at least the initial layers uh, using a lot of unsupervised techniques that are cheaper. So for example, things like orthogonal matching pursuits, sparse coding. Um, as opposed to its background. Uh, and that's going to be augmented then by uh, several supervised uh, stages which are not convolutional, so those are just going to be uh, more straightforward MLP layers that, uh, that work on top of those features that we learn. Uh, the second issue of uh, field of view, so you know, what we're doing is taking some n by n by n cube, classifying uh, the pixel in the middle of that cube, uh, and we'd like to be able to use much more context uh, to resolve ambiguities uh, in our data. Uh, but you know, in 3D, just doubling the linear dimension, that's almost an order of magnitude more voxels. So somehow we need to do this uh, in, a, in an efficient way. Um, so you know, the obvious parameters are, of course, the number of layers, the size of the filters. Uh, we're going to do a few other things. We're going to add multi-scale pathways uh, in the whole architecture. Uh, and then we're also going to introduce uh, a notion of uh, foveated pooling, where uh, different, um, different areas in the image will be represented at different resolutions. 
depending on how far they are from where you're actually trying to classify. Uh, finally, we'd like to be able to model system structure in a naval space. So what do we mean by that? So here's a video showing some ground truth annotation uh, of this data. So this is a human that's gone through and basically segmented the data. Uh, and you know, what you can tell is that you know, it's not, uh, there's fairly low dimensional space of possible structures here that, that are sort of plausible. Uh, it's not like anything can happen. Uh, certainly it's more low dimensional than the natural language is uh, So somehow we'd like to be able to take advantage of that uh, in our inference pipeline. Um, so, I mean, more concretely, you know, labels for neighboring image locations are correlated. Uh, so it's really a structure prediction problem. Um, <clears throat> and in most of our approaches, we're really making these predictions more or less independently. They're only correlated through the image. So, you know, an obvious way to go is to define some sort of MRF over the images or the predictions that we're making, clean them up, up that way. Uh, we did a lot of work showing that, you know, there's some issues with doing this effectively. Uh, I'm not going to go into those arguments, but I'm sure you're interested to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to do something different. We're going to take our, our architecture and just add a new pathway. We're going to take our output uh, and connect it to our input. Uh, and so overall, what the entire architecture is going to look like is something like this, where uh, we have recursive steps of the overall architecture, which is sort of that bottom pipeline there. Uh, and then blown up is the architecture at any individual step. So you see those multi-scale pathways. Um, there's the feature extraction stage, which is largely unsupervised, uh, and then the supervised stage on top. And each recursive step is going to get input from both the previous set of predictions as well as the original image. Uh, and that will generate the final uh, output here, which is something called an infinity graph. But you can basically just give that as a boundary map. Uh, and one nice thing about this is that it actually scales pretty well, so you can uh, distribute across both CPUs and GPUs. So we use the CPU cluster um, to do the unsupervised feature extraction stage that parallelizes very cleanly. Uh, and then we store those features and then just train <coughs> NLP on the GPU. So actually, uh, we can train very large models. So for example, we currently, the best models that we, that we use use the 50 cubed voxel input. That's 100,000 voxels in total. Uh, there's about 12 or 13 layers. Um, but we can train that within a day or two. Um, and in the paper that we have in this conference, we show that we can actually get better results than at least the previous convolutional nets that we were using um, pretty quickly uh, using this type of approach. Okay, so I mainly just wanted to set up that model because that's what we're going to be using um, in uh, the second part of the talk, which is about um, 3D log ratio. Uh, so the idea uh, here is that you know once you've done your boundary prediction, what you really get is this sea of fragments. Uh, so these are basically super pixels, or in this case, super voxels. Um, you know, distributed throughout your image space, uh, and now the task is to piece those fragments together into large coherent holes. Okay. Uh, so previously, we had actually defined an inference framework for solving this problem. It's actually uh, was quite reminiscent of the previous talk. It's essentially uh, a deterministic MVP uh, that has a state, which is your segmentation, and various actions like piecing together fragments or asking a human. The computer's not sure, uh, and then we use techniques from on policy control. Uh, in our RL to, to learn the, to, to learn how, how to do this difference process. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, for the purposes of this talk, what this boils down to is a sequence of binary decisions about whether two fragments are uh, part of the same neuron or a different neuron. So on the left is a negative example, so those two fragments should not be merged together. On the right is a positive example, those two fragments should be merged together. Uh, but more generally, there's you know, a lot of different applications that involve reasoning about 3D objects. So, for example, here's a paper from Toronto, Learning 3D Mesh Segmentation Labeling, where they have uh, existing models of 3D objects, and they want to basically segment those models into different semantically meaningful parts. Um, and the way they did this was to define some hand-defined 3D features, uh, so various things that measure curvature or other properties of the object, uh, and then put that into a CRF, which would do the actual segmentation. Um, similarly, there's uh, been a lot of work on 3D shape retrieval, so given some 3D objects, finding things that are similar or related, um, and you know, especially with the advent of things like 3D printing and handheld 3D uh, modeling uh, platforms, uh, there's a lot more data uh, coming online. But uh, the thing which I want to stress here is that all approaches thus far have really been based on hand design feature representations in this context. So people will basically come up with um, some insight into what uh, properties of 3D shape might be relevant, uh, encode that uh, in some feature representation, uh, and then do machine learning on top of that. So far, it's been very difficult to just learn from the data uh, what those features should look like. Uh, so what we're doing is taking an object uh, in 3D space. Uh, it could be quite large, in fact. 
um, and then trying to come up with some features that are that are useful for, in our case, agglomeration, but you know, could be other tasks as well. Uh, and so in this paper, we basically compare two, two different approaches. So we take the hand design approach, uh, where we take a large library of 3D geometry and morphology descriptors, uh, and then we also take a purely learning-based approach, where we just feed um, you know, various networks the raw data uh, and see if they can learn how to represent the data, represent the objects uh, for the prediction task. <clears throat> so in terms of the manually designed features, uh, you know, there, there's a whole literature from the past 20 or 30 years of people experimenting with different types of representation of 3D objects. Uh, you know, there's things like level sets, various kinds of ray tracing approaches, spherical harmonics. Uh, I'm not going to go to the details, but in our paper we actually uh, went through a lot of effort to implement all the different types of features that people uh, have come up with, um, at least most of them, uh, and rigorously compare the performance. So if you're interested in any kind of 3D modeling task, I would recommend that you check out this figure in the paper. It might save you a lot of work. Uh, we, we also uh, note the computational cost as well as the accuracy of the classification task. But we were really interested in seeing whether we could just learn the right representation. So to feed those objects directly uh, into some sort of network and you know, get good prediction results out of that. Uh, and doing the naive thing of basically just putting those objects through, it doesn't work at all. So uh, we have this performance figure in the paper. Uh, the second best line you see there, the red line, I don't know, it's big enough, uh, that's from using the entire set of hand design features uh, that we've designed, that we've defined. Uh, and all those other curves that are significantly below that, the dotted ones and both, uh, those are from basically the naive approach of just shoving 3D objects through some sort of convolutional network or unsupervised feature extractor. Um, so basically, it, it doesn't work. So maybe if we had much more data, um, it, it would work. But certainly, with the amount of data that we had, it did not. Uh, so we had to go back and you know see if there was something we had to add to our architecture to, to make it work. Uh, and it turns out there's something pretty simple you can do, and that's based on uh, a notion of dynamic pooling. So within our feature extraction stage, we basically um, added uh, an alternative notion of pooling as opposed to you know, something fixed like max pooling or average pooling over fixed spatial windows. Uh, instead, what we do is we dynamically pool features based on the shape of the objects that we're trying to represent. So for example, if we're trying to decide if two objects merge, uh, we uh, introduced one notion um, called uh, object pooling, which basically will just pool from the union of the two objects. Uh, and we introduce something else called boundary pooling, which basically looks at the area close to the interface of two objects in a particular way. Um, and this figure might be a little bit difficult to follow, but on the right you can see basically the 3D rendering of the, uh, uh, of the region we end up pooling over in, in some different cases. Uh, and you know, once you add in this type of pooling, uh, the results are, are much better. So there you can in fact start to beat um, the hand design feature set. Um, at least by a little bit. So if we go back to this figure, uh, the best performing curve there, the purple one, it is using both this dynamic boundary and object pooling uh, in this context. Uh, so there's a lot more work to be done here in terms of uh, uh, improving these models for this task further, but uh, you know, we're excited about uh, the first step of at least getting learning to work better than the hand designed uh, features here. Uh, so that's it. I'm just going to acknowledge a lot of people who contributed to the data. Uh, in this talk, and finally, um, if anybody's interested, there's sort of a new effort to solve this connectomics issue of, uh, at Google scale, so to speak. Uh, and if you're interested, just get in touch. Thanks. between your dynamic pooling and what Pedro Domingos was talking about 
uh, in which you would somehow optimize where to pool? Um, well, so our notion of dynamic pooling is coming from sort of the mass of the objects in the input. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what, uh, what Pedro was referring to, his notion of invariance and symmetry. Whether it was input dependent, uh, you know, for example. Input dependent pooling. For example. Or, for example. Okay, so it might, it might be similar terms.